peace and the mercy and blessings of Allah be with you all. Thank you. Thank you for joining me on this live post. I begin by praising our creator and fashioner, creator of the heavens and the earth. I say Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah. And uh, I ask God to bless you all. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, peace and the mercy and blessings of God be with you all. So today I'm commenting on Mark's gospel. I'll go to Bible Hub. Uh, dot com where I will look up Mark uh, gospel according to Mark and I'll go to chapter 4 that's where we are in this series and uh, I'll deal with the new international version easy to read has some uh, uh, topical headings in between so it's easy to follow what's going on so I'll get a drink here Hello. Mm. Okay, so uh, we have a first the parable of the sower. So here, Jesus on whom be peace is telling a story. Uh, it, it's called a parable. Why is it a parable? Because uh, there is a, a kind of life situation that is being discussed. Discussed a, a story that is being is being described, and out of that story, we're going to draw a lesson. This story stands in the place of like the characters in the story stand for. Um, somebody else like we're going to draw a lesson from that we might see ourselves in the story so here it is <clears throat> uh, so a farmer uh, goes out to sow his seed he's scattering the seeds some fall uh, along the path uh, the birds came and eat them up some fall on rocky places so they can't grow uh, some um, uh, um, Okay, so it grows quickly, but because the earth is, is below it is shallow, uh, it, it does not uh, last long. The sun comes out, dries it up, and so on. Um, but then others, other seeds fell fall among the thorns. They grow up, but they get choked by the plants, so they did not bear grain. Still others fall on good soil. Uh, it came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, 60, uh, 100 times. So, you know, a parable like this is in Hadith as well about the uh, revelation that comes from God. It comes like uh, the rain falling on different kinds of soil. So the, the uh, basic teaching of both this parable and the one that is found in Hadith is that a lot depends on the recipient. The word of God is preached to us, but then how do we receive it? Uh, is our heart, uh, are our hearts as hard as rock uh, so that the revelation from God does not penetrate? Uh, is it like fertile soil that will absorb the revelation from God and uh, allow it to bear fruit in our lives in terms of good deeds and, and so on? So um, Jesus says, whoever has ears to hear, let them uh, hear. Now, the 12 and others around him asked him about the parables. This is in verse number 10. And he told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables. Uh, so that, and now he quotes a verse from the Old Testament, they may uh, be ever seeing, but never perceiving, and ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Now, the, the way in which this is uh, put together uh, in, in Mark's gospel uh, uh, might give the whole impression as if Jesus uh, doesn't want people to understand in general. He, he just tells, the, you know, he explains everything to his disciples, but he's not explaining it to the public lest they should understand and turn. Uh, but uh, of course, from a Muslim point of view, we wouldn't see Jesus in that role of uh, trying to deprive people of getting the message, but rather he gives the message. There is some slight uh, emphasis and mark here uh, that uh, a Muslim would find difficult uh, to, to accept. So uh, we, we, we can understand that there is a certain uh, degree uh, of uh, uh, you know, uh, thinking that, okay, we've already delivered the message. They don't want to hear the message. That's up to them. You know, let them uh, go to their own perdition. You know, there's a certain degree of that, that, uh, you know, but if it crosses a certain line where you're saying, okay, I don't want them to know the, the, the truth lest they turn and be forgiven, then I'm only going to tell the truth to the, uh, uh, you know, close circle of disciples. But why would Mark present it this way? It could be part of uh, Mark's whole strategy of trying to show that, well, you know, the original um, people did not quite, uh, the original hearers, the first hearers of Jesus, did not quite understand his message. It is later on 
that people came to understand the message. And what they understood later on is probably something that was secretly delivered, like told to the uh, disciples. So, so Jesus is often explaining secret things to the disciples. And that would explain why, like if somebody says later on, okay, Jesus is uh, the divine son. Uh, and uh, someone says, well, wait a minute, but we never heard that from Jesus. Well, the possibility now is opened by Mark to say, well, okay, maybe there was something more about Jesus than he, that was publicly known. It was known privately. Okay, so then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? And then he explained the parable uh, to them. And then he spoke about a lamp on a stand. He said to them, do you bring a lamp and put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? Uh, so in other words, uh, you know, the, the hidden things will be, now become disclosed. And whatever is concealed now is going to be brought into the open. Uh, consider carefully what you hear, he said. But the measure you use, it will measure, be measured uh, to you and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken away from them. Now, the, the idea of, uh, you know, publicizing the, the news and so on, all of this rings true. But then it, it, it doesn't seem to gel with Jesus teaching uh, the explanations of all of the parables uh, to, or some, at least some of the parables to his uh, disciples in private. Um, now, this statement about whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. Um, it, it does not bode well, uh, like, we're, we're, how does that play out in, in practice? These are short, pithy sayings, and they require some elaboration. But you can see how a statement like that might be misused by some people who think that, okay, the rich should get richer and the poor should get the poorer. Then there's the parable of the growing seed in verse number 26. He said to them, uh, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day, wherever he, whether he sleeps or gets up. The seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. Uh, first the stalk, and then the head, and then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because uh, the harvest has come. So here is a parable, and, it, and I don't see the explanation immediately here. Maybe it is explained later on. And uh, it's, it's not clear what is meant uh, by this um, parable. And then there's the parable of the mustard seed. Again, he said, this is verse number 30. Uh, what should we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable should be used to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants uh, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. Now, this statement that the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds, which is in uh, Mark chapter 4, verse 31, this has been contested uh, scientifically. It's now known that the mustard seed is not the smallest of all seeds. And this gives rise to a whole um, um, level of discussion as to, you know, how do we regard Jesus and his knowledge if uh, Christians take him to be God? Mm, how do we explain that maybe he did not um, know some such thing uh, that scientists now know? Um, the answer to that from a traditional Christian perspective could be that Jesus, well, he went through this what they call kenosis, emptying himself of uh, some divine attributes. Uh, but then something like knowledge, it's hard to see how you would empty yourself of knowledge. Like how do you block what you already know? Um, so th this is a difficulty. In any case, uh, we go on now to the last um, episode that is mentioned in uh, Mark chapter 4. This is where Jesus calms the storm. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let go let's go over to the other side. And he leaves the crowd behind, uh, and leaving the crowd behind, they took him along. So uh, the disciples take him uh, along um, just as he was in the boat. Uh, then there were other boats also with him. Uh, a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, 
quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to the disciples, why are you so afraid? Uh, do you still have no faith? Uh, they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Now, let's go with that last verse for the moment, verse number 41. See how this chapter ends. The, the, the disciples don't know what to make of him. And they ask him, like, who is this? Um, so uh, th this this is part and parcel of Mark's uh, what is called the messianic secret, as described by a, a scholar of the past, William Reed. And uh, this now is is still being discussed whether or not there is such a thing as a messianic secret in Mark's gospel. Uh, but passages like this uh, can be brought forward to say that uh, uh, Mark. Uh, is is presenting a picture here in which Jesus was not clearly declaring himself to be the Messiah and he was not so well known as the Messiah in his lifetime. It's later on that people come to uh, know this. So you can see up until like four, uh, four chapters into Mark's gospel, this is after Jesus had healed, healed the paralytic and said, your sins are forgiven. Uh, this is after he had healed the man with the withered hand. Uh, this is after he has just calmed the storm and like he commanded the, the waves, be still and, uh, and, and the wind and, and looks like the wind and the waves are obeying him, obeying him and still uh, they don't know what to make of him. Like, who is this? They're asking. Uh, now, uh, look at the, the rebuke that they, they, um, they issued in, in verse number 38. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him up and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? Uh, you, you can you can see the impertinence in their in their voices here. You can hear it. And so why would they be speaking to Jesus in this way if Jesus had already been recognized by this time to be the Son, the Son of God, the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world, which is what we find in John's Gospel. In John's Gospel, what was Mark chapter one describing the baptism scene? In John's Gospel chapter one, in the baptism scene. Uh, Jesus has already declared to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Even in Mark's Gospel, there is this voice uh, from heaven declaring Jesus to be the Son of God, God himself speaking and saying, this is my Son. Now, if all, everything happened as was already described therein, uh, like in chapter 1, how is it that in chapter 4, we still have the disciples wondering, like, what, why doesn't one of them say, oh, we know he's the son of God. That's why when he commands the uh, waves, they obey him. This is why when he commands the wind, the wind obeys. Um, but, but it seems that they don't really know. So that means the story uh, is not coherently put together. What we can see then in a nutshell is that um, Jesus came, he lived, he uh, walked with his disciples, he taught, he was lifted up, and then later on, other doctrines are being introduced about Jesus. Jesus said this, Jesus taught this, Jesus was this, he was that, and so on. And uh, it, when, when it is asked, well, how, how is it that none of that was known publicly? Uh, the the answer is that well you know it was maybe done privately but still uh, the there are stories developing that showing showing that Jesus uh, was declared publicly like for example in in uh, Mark chapter one to be the son of God and those stories are retained as well but you can't have it both ways you can't have it that it was publicly declared and also that nobody knows it. Uh, so you, you have a kind of discrepancy here. And the best way to explain that is to say that uh, the idea that it was uh, done by such public announcement uh, is, is a later exaggeration. And that is given now as part of the original story, which it uh, wasn't. And uh, Muslims would say too, that um, to have it that Jesus did not uh, clearly uh, proclaim who he was uh, as the Messiah, the messenger of God, prophet of God, and so on. That too is an exaggeration. So you can see that the exaggeration works both ways. And we have both within the Gospels. On the one hand, there is the exaggeration of the status and position of Jesus and, uh, and stories that go to support that exaggeration. And on the other hand, you have the exaggeration that Jesus wasn't telling anybody who he was. And, uh, and you have the stories that support that exaggeration as well. Well, and when the two are brought 
together in the gospel as we have it now, uh, then we can see the, the dichotomy and the difference between the two. I'll have a quick look at your comments and so on to make sure that everything is working right. Uh, I'll know because I see comments and uh, I don't see anyone saying that anything is wrong. I can see from Salu Salman and uh, Salam and uh, questions from Nahyan and uh, Salu and uh, Hamza saying Salam. Uh, so, wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to you all. And I'll get back to your comments and your questions in a moment. Uh, let me see uh, who has shared my post, if anyone. And um, I don't see that anyone has shared it today. Maybe they have, but I, I, it, somehow it's not apparent to me. Uh, so please, uh, if you like what I'm saying, then uh, share it as well on your own streams. Uh, so that uh, it can become uh, available to others as well. Um, okay, so uh, we may have time for one more chapter before I go to your questions and comments. So let me just do another chapter. So we're now going to look at chapter 5. Okay, so Mark chapter 5. So Jesus restores a demon-possessed man. Uh, verse 1, they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. Uh, when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man uh, lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him any anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been chained hand and foot. But he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Uh, when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man you impure spirit and then uh, then Jesus asked him what is your name that my name is a legion he replied for we are many and he begged Jesus again uh, and again not to send them out into uh, out of the area a large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside the demons begged Jesus send us among the pigs allow us to go into them he gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs the herd about 2,000 in number rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned those tending the pigs ran off and reported this into town and countryside and the people went out to see what had happened when they came to Jesus they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind and they were afraid those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon possessed man and told him about the told about the pigs as well then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region as Jesus was getting into the boat the man who had been demon possessed begged to go with him Jesus did not let him but said go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell the, the, in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and all the people were amazed. So uh, this is an interesting story that uh, deserves a number of comments. So let's uh, take them uh, one at a time. Uh, first of all, uh, this man is demon possessed. It is interesting that in the Quran, there is no uh, story about Jesus uh, um, exorcising devils from, from anyone. But in the Gospels, uh, this seems to be a frequent occurrence. And in this one instance, we have like a whole legion of uh, demons um, uh, possessing this, this man. Uh, now, when, when we think about the demon possession uh, situation, we have to ask about the Spirit of God. Uh, in Jesus, uh, because there, there, there is a passage of the Bible which says that the Spirit of God, uh, like the, the fullness of deity, dwelt, dwelt in him bodily. So you can say that in, in a way, the Spirit of God was in, in Jesus. But then that wouldn't make Jesus the Spirit of God, just as it, in the case of this demoniac, uh, the, the man um, remains a man, and, and he is separate and distinct from the spirit who spoke in him this evil spirit so the evil spirit is driven out or the spirits are driven out and this man remains uh, his true self 
so we can distinguish then between Jesus and the spirit, if there is a spirit in Jesus, as we can in Christians, like a spirit comes and dwells in Christians, that's the Holy Spirit, they say, and uh, the Christian is still separate and distinct from the Holy Spirit. The spirit Christian can talk to the Holy Spirit, can perhaps even pray to the Holy Spirit. So Jesus uh, is uh, obviously in a similar situation um, if we say that the Spirit of God was in Jesus. Um, so so that the, the idea of the Spirit possession uh, gives us a chance to think more clearly about what is meant when Christians say that Jesus has the Spirit of God with him or in him. Now, it is interesting that uh, the, the, the spirits... Um, Asked Jesus not to send them out of the area, and uh, they asked for permission to go into the pigs, and he allows them to go into the pigs, and uh, as a result, the pigs uh, rushed down this steep uh, bank into the lake and were drowned. So um, this seems to involve the destruction of uh, somebody else's property, uh, and one wonders uh, as a result of this whether Jesus had foreseen uh, all of this happening like did he realize that by giving the sp spirits the permission to go into the pigs the 2000 pigs will uh, go to their destruction like this and of course it's not only somebody else's property but of course these are live animals uh, to have them killed in this in this way uh, it's a different thing when uh, animals are slaughtered for food even there though uh, there the vegetarians and, and vegans uh, would protest, uh, but um, and animal rights activists more generally may, may see reason to defend animals from being slaughtered even for food. But uh, um, people of religion might say, uh, especially uh, in, in Christianity and Islam, they might say, well, well, you know, you, you slaughter for food is to be being done with God's permission to use the animals for the benefit of man as God created it for our benefit created the animals for our benefit, gave us permission to use them such. Uh, but uh, uh, to have them just destroyed like this does, uh, does not seem to have uh, much of a point. Now, uh, the, he, he, he tells the demon-possessed man, well, who is now free of his demons, uh, to go and tell the people how much the Lord has done for, for him, and... Uh, how he is at mercy on you and uh, the man went away and began to tell uh, in the decapolis how uh, jesus how much jesus had done for him so from this some people would conclude oh see jesus is the lord uh, well two things have to be said about this first of all the term the lord is ambiguous it can refer to the lord god or it can re refer to the lord meaning sir or master uh, in this case, we would have to take it as, uh, you know, there is a kind of a, an ambiguity here. Uh, and uh, we, we cannot conclude from this ambiguity that Jesus is the Lord God. Um, well, you know, there's a lot more to be explained, like what Jesus meant and what the man took it to mean and so on. All of these are things uh, to be explained. And uh, that brings us to a point about trying to prove that Jesus is God by using uh, statements either from the Gospel of Mark or in, in the Bible altogether. There is no clear, simple, direct statement saying that Jesus is God. Uh, what we have are some indirect statements, some questionable statements, some statements that may be translated this way or that and so on and uh, you know if the the idea of who is god uh, th that has to be very clear from the start and uh, you would expect it to be in very clear language not by you know let's put these two and two together so jesus said go tell them how much the lord has done for you and then the man goes and says uh, and tells them how much jesus had done for him you can say that uh, even if the lord god did this for the man through the agency of jesus you can say it both ways you can say the lord god did this uh, to me the man could say the lord god did this to me uh, or he could say that jesus did this to me uh, or for me and uh, he is basically talking about this singular event in which the lord god used jesus his servant as an agent through which and through whom uh, to do this favor for the man so there would be no contradiction so with a, once an explanation like this uh, is available uh, we see the paucity of the uh, proof for the divinity of jesus Jesus. And to finish this chapter, I now come to uh, Jesus, the, the last section in which Jesus raises a dead girl and heals a sick woman. 
starting with verse number 21 of Mark chapter 5. Uh, when Jesus had again crossed over the boat by the other, uh, to the other side of the lake, so basically a crowd gathered around him, a large uh, crowd followed and pressed around him, and there's a woman who had been uh, uh, bleeding for 12 years. Uh, she, doctors couldn't cure her. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, thinking, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. And immediately her bleeding stopped. And she felt in her body that uh, she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? Uh, you see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered. And yet you ask, who touched me? You see the impertinence of the disciples uh, again. And uh, uh, but but what is interesting is that it, the verse number thirty two says, but Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it, and uh, what what this seems to indicate is that Jesus, on whom be peace, uh, has great power flowing out of him, uh, but uh, somehow he's lacking a bit of the knowledge, and he doesn't seem to have the control of the power to decide like this power should go to heal that person. Uh, it looks like some other. Uh, entity is in control of that power and we would say this as God so this woman came and touched the clothes of Jesus and she was healed and Jesus didn't know who it was that was healed or or, or, or who touched him and he kept looking around and his disciples are asking you know why do you even bother to ask so, because so many people are pressing against you uh, and uh, eventually the girl owned up to this uh, and uh, he says daughter your faith has healed you go in peace now when he called her a daughter and that, that's not his real daughter and that shows how the scripture is using language uh, otherwise we would if Jesus is God uh, because he's the son of God then this would be the granddaughter of uh, of God and uh, you know and so on but of course nobody says that this girl is literally the daughter of Jesus uh, so why press other language to make it uh, so literal uh, we should take things in a reasonable way and then to close off the chapter, in the same chapter 5, starting with verse number 35, we have the story about uh, it, the, Jesus raising a girl uh, back to life. So, uh, the Jairus, the synagogue uh, leader, um, is being told that his uh, daughter is dead. So, why should he bother the teacher anymore? Uh, but uh, Jesus said, don't be afraid, just believe. Then he didn't allow anyone to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Uh, and and so, so Peter, James, and the brother of James, whose name is John. Uh, when they came to the home of the synagogue uh, leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly because they thought the girl is dead. And he went in and said, while this commotion and wailing, the child is not dead, but asleep. But it laughed at him. Uh, after he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in there uh, where the child was. Uh, he took her by the hand and said, Talitha kumi. So he, he, he spoke um, uh, Aramaic here, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Well, of course, he's often speaking in Aramaic, but in this one instance, uh, Mark has given us the Aramaic wording. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. And uh, Mark tells us here in parentheses, uh, at least in the English translation, is in parentheses, she was 12 years old. And then the people were completely astonished and gave strict orders not to tell anyone about this and told them to give her something to eat. So he, he, again, you see this messianic secret. He tells them not to tell anyone about this. Why not? Why shouldn't they tell anyone about it? Um, uh, but uh, looking at other aspects here, uh, now Jesus healing the, the girl. The Quran also says that, G that uh, Jesus healed the blind and uh, cured the leper and raised the dead back to life. So what is meant by raising the dead back to life? In, um, in, in Muslim literature, there are stories about Jesus coming to a person who is buried there in his grave, calls the person back out of the grave, the person comes out and it's all dusty and so on from the dust of the earth and so on. But these, these are fantastic stories and they're not in the Quran. But you can see where a legend can pick up and how a story like that can develop. Well, in, in the Gospel according to Mark, we have the barest of story. Here we have a story uh, of a girl being raised back to life and uh, the, the whole story becomes now a little bit ambiguous as to whether or not the girl was really dead because the people thought she was dead and they reported her dead, but Jesus said she's not dead, she's only sleeping. 
And so did he mean that, okay, I know she's dead, but, but the, the, what I will do uh, will uh, now make it appear that she was only sleeping because I'm going to bring her back to life. Did he mean that? Or did he mean truly that she's only sleeping, but you guys just don't know the difference between the, the, a sleeping person and a dead person? And uh, of course, you know, today, even sometimes medical doctors are fooled, especially if somebody has been under the influence of drugs or something like this. Maybe the person who falls into a coma, appears dead. And uh, later on, if the, as the drug wears out, uh, the person may recover and come back to his or her senses. Uh, now, if we think about that, then we have to ask, well, what about people thinking that Jesus was dead on the cross? Was he really dead? Um, or did he just you know, whatever, maybe he took some drugs. Uh, the, uh, not, not that he took it deliberately as we take, you know, somebody takes street drugs today, but uh, at the crucifixion scene, sometimes a drug was administered uh, to the crucified victim to numb the pain a little bit, and who knows what exactly was in the mixture uh, in this particular case. But uh, one of the Gospels said that uh, they, um, uh, that, that Jesus at least tasted it um, so we don't know how much of it he actually drank and what effect he might have had in his body but whether by the drugs or not is it possible that he appeared to be dead and uh, he wasn't in fact dead uh, so here we have in the case of this girl this ambiguity is there and um, and one wonders about Jesus's own situation as as well. Now, we also have a chance to think more clearly about this idea of Jesus raising the dead back to life. There are people for whom, like if you tell a story like the one which is there in Muslim literature about Jesus calling the person out of the grave, the person coming out with dust all over his head and so on from the earth, uh, some people say, yeah, ah, this is so awesome. And, and they believe the story. But uh, so, uh, many others will say, no, wait a minute, this is fantastic. This sounds like a fairy tale um, it doesn't seem believable now of course uh, with uh, uh, on the belief that God can do anything then um, a Muslim believer can submit if we have an authentic a clear record that uh, God did something, we will say, okay, well, we have to submit to that because everything is in the power of God. Uh, Christians will agree with that basic principle as well. Uh, but when we get it in stories which are not in the Quran, not in the most authentic books of Hadith, uh, then we wonder, like, is that a made-up story? Now, when we come to Mark's Gospel, Mark's Gospel gives us this kind of barest of narrative where the girl is ambiguously between life and death is she really dead or not and then she uh, jesus does what he does uh, and and she uh, wakes up and she's there um and and whatever he does he did was not so clear to everyone only a few people knew about it only peter james and john uh, went in with him um, so was this some kind of secret way, a, sec uh, uh, a way of CPR that was not known to people at the time? How did Jesus actually bring her back to, uh, to life? If he was administering something like CPR, is that why he took only a few uh, most trusted disciples? Because maybe that would be a scandal for the people to see Jesus operating on a girl like this, um, especially since he was already 12 years old. About that time, the girls would start, uh, you know, be getting betrothed uh, to be married and so on in that culture at that time. Uh, so uh, there's a lot to ponder here, a lot to think about, but here we have come to uh, the end of Mark chapter 5, and you can see both in Mark chapter 4 with Jesus calming the storm and people don't know what to make of it, and here in chapter 5 uh, with uh, Jesus uh, bringing this girl back to life, the people are completely astonished, and, and they don't know what to make of all of this, and he gives them orders not to go, you know, um, uh, broaching this to the to the public so still we have a situation where jesus is not known uh in the public to be uh like clearly the son of god uh or uh, anything uh, uh other than just a human being a prophet a messenger uh, of of god and um so I'm going to leave it at that. Take your questions and comments, and then when we, on another occasion, we'll deal with uh, chapters 6 onwards. Uh, so let me go to your comments and uh, move this so that I can um, look at your comments closer to the screen, closer to the camera. Okay, so...
Okay, and I see that uh, Brother Ubaidullah Al Hassan has shared my uh, stream, and uh, uh, Brother Lima Mua uh, has also shared it. Uh, so thank you, thank you both for that. And I say, brother, not knowing is it a brother's name or a sister's name? Please forgive me if I make a mistake um, in, in that way. Uh, so now, coming to your questions and your comments, let me see. So we have Salu saying salam, wa alaikum salam, Nahyan. Uh, what are the reasons Mark doesn't mention the virgin birth of Jesus? So, uh, Brother Nahyan, we can't uh, be uh, totally sure what are the reasons for Mark not mentioning it. Uh, but uh, scholars generally thinking about Mark being the earliest and the others being later. Uh, in fact, this is one of the reasons they think Mark is earlier. Because if we have already the, birth, uh, the, the story of the birth of Jesus in, in Matthew and Luke, and they're before Mark, Mark is looking at this, why would he omit that and start his story with only the baptism of uh, Jesus? Why, didn't he, why doesn't he include an inkling of the, those birth stories? So it could be that those birth stories were not... Uh, already in the Gospels before him. And so he was working with whatever knowledge was available to him at the time. And uh, the, based on what is available, he makes a judgment to start the story with the Gospel, with, with the baptism scene in, in John's, uh, in uh, the, the baptism of John, John's baptism of Jesus. Uh, so uh, the, the the scholars now see that Matthew and Luke wanted to expand the story and include the virgin birth. So they're then pushing back the, the, the adoption of Jesus uh, to an earlier period. So uh, the scholars would say that uh, in Mark's gospel, we have the, in the baptism scene, God adopting Jesus as his son by a public declaration. But Matthew and Luke push back the moment when Jesus becomes the son of God to an earlier time, namely the time when Jesus is conceived by their stories of the uh, virginal conception. And then John, got, John's gospel, they say, the last of the four pushes back uh, the uh, time when Jesus becomes the Son of God uh, back to all eternity because Jesus has always been uh, with God uh, in, in John's Gospel at least from the beginning whatever John means by the beginning is not specified uh, is it the beginning of the creation of the heavens and the earth uh, or just before that beginning or the beginning of the story that John wants to tell um, or what but in any case John pushes the um, a relationship back to uh, an earlier uh, time, much earlier time. Uh, so, so that's how it is to generally analyzed, uh, and I leave it at that for the time being. Okay, and uh, Salu uh, ex uh, saying, explaining the Gospels to the Muslims is uh, one of the unique ideas, uh, and we as Muslims can get a different perspective of the life of Jesus through the Gospels. Thank you for that uh, vote of confidence, uh, Brother uh, Salu. I, I wondered about the wisdom of doing this, but I think it is uh, important that Muslims understand uh, the, the Gospels as a whole, uh, because we're often uh, referring to things within the Gospels, we're quoting verses, here and there and uh, it is important for us to see the big picture as we quote the specific verses so uh, that's uh, part of my reasoning for doing this and thank you for that vote of confidence and salam from brother Hamza wa alaikum as salam and uh, Hamza is saying I watched your discussion on uh, Sufism uh, Suk oh Suk Islam uh, with brother Ismail uh, uh, Yusuf Ismail Sam Green and John McClatchy it's good to know that we can get together and have such a discussion yeah thank you brother Hamza Hamza uh, that was an interesting discussion and uh, I believe it was aired on South African TV um, over the last uh, couple of days uh, so I hope that people are benefiting from that. Nahyan, uh, what you asking? What do you think about Q and what happened to Jesus in Q? So in in uh, Q uh, is a is a gospel that uh, uh, was used as a source by Matthew and Luke uh, for some 250 sayings, which are common common sayings of Jesus, common in both Matthew and uh, Luke. They're thought by scholars to be derived from that uh, source. Uh, now, that uh, source has been reconstructed into 114 sayings um, and, and, and it's now published as the Q Gospel and it's being analyzed by scholars. When scholars analyze that uh, Gospel, they do not find that uh, that Q Gospel uh, places any 
a salvific type of um, commentary on the death of Jesus. They, they, they don't see the death of Jesus as something like in the, in the Gospels we have now in the Bible, uh, depicting this as Jesus dying for the sins of the world and, and, and so on. Um, and of course, the idea of the resurrection from the dead, uh, that does not seem to feature in, in the Q Gospel. Uh, however, uh, Daniel Smith, uh, in his doctoral thesis entitled The Vindication of Jesus in the Sig, uh, sayings gospel Q um, has uh, posited that what Q has in mind, uh, especially in 1149, I believe is the reference, um, the, is, is not a resurrection from the dead, but as, as an assumption uh, into heaven, uh, uh, possibly from the tomb of Jesus. Uh, so Jesus, uh, let's say Jesus dies, he comes out of his grave, he meets with his disciples, uh, and then he eventually ascends into heaven. This is the basic story of the Gospel of Luke. And so we have like a three-part thing here. Jesus dies, he is, comes out of the tomb, and he meets with his disciples, and then he is raised up. But in the Q Gospel, it is like death and assumption into heaven. And uh, even a, a scholar, Dieter Zeller, thinks that uh, the assumption that is spoken about here is not of uh, Jesus who died, uh, but uh, it is of a live Jesus. Uh, and uh, that ties in with what we know from Matthew's uh, gospel, uh, where it says that, uh, you know, the sign of Jonah. Well, uh, the Matthew's gospel expounds upon it to say that as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so the set shall the son of man be three nights, uh, three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. Uh, but uh, in Mark's, in Luke's gospel, which has a shorter version, which is more representative of Q here, Matthew being a kind of an expansion of the story, uh, there's just a bare mention of the sign of Jonah. So what exactly was the sign of Jonah? This requires a lot of commentary, but the commentary given by Dieter Zeller and, uh, and, and Smith uh, is that it, it means an, an assumption. As Jonah was uh, saved by God, Jesus was also saved by God. And uh, Dieter Zeller's unique uh, um, uh, commentary on this is to say that uh, this is about a life Jesus being assumed into heaven. So. These are interesting um, uh, studies that came out of the Gospel Q. Okay, now Jan, did Jesus predict the destruction of Jerusalem? Mm, and this, uh, I, I'm not aware of how scholars have treated the, um, his predictions about the destruction of Jerusalem itself. Um, I have to think about that, uh, and, and like when I go back to my books, I'll, I'll you know have this in mind. I can't promise you an answer right away. Uh, I know about the prediction of his own uh, death. Um, the scholars are very hesitant about. Um, most think that he did not present, uh, he did not predict, at least in those details. Like Jesus could have foretold that he's going into Jerusalem because of what he's been preaching. There's a lot of opposition. Some people will want to kill him, especially the religious leaders of his day. Um, so he, you know, he could have anticipated, okay, they're going to try to kill me. But to give those details, after three days, you will rise and so on. This seems to be like after the, after Christians have already adopted such a belief, they then uh, reworded that belief into the words of Jesus and put him, uh, uh, put that uh, belief into his uh, own lips and recorded that in the in the Gospels. So it's an after the fact type of um, historicization of of what they already see happening. Um, so they create a prophecy uh, based on what they see already happening. Now, as for the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, when the scholars date the Gospels, uh, one of the reasons they date the Gospels as they do is that they don't think that Jesus actually predicted the uh, destruction of Jerusalem. They thought that they think that the Gospels are written at a time when either Jerusalem is uh, about to be destroyed or just after the destruction of Jerusalem. Mostly they think it's after the war is already started and Jerusalem is being destroyed or has been destroyed. So they place the first gospel, the gospel according to Mark, uh, around the year 70. And the Jewish war took place from the year 66 to about 70. So they're thinking uh, that Jerusalem is destroyed and now Mark is writing and he's writing as if Jesus predicted the destruction of Jerusalem but Jesus did not actually predict it. But I haven't 
done a lot of studies on that in particular uh, and that requires a little bit more uh, for me to think about and go back to my books and maybe in a future post comment some more. Okay, Hamza, Hamza, Sheikh, uh, do you take your stance on Hadith due to a new modern Western research, the Mu'tazili uh, uh, Mu'tazila uh, methodology, or simply because some of the Hadith are hard to believe? I just want to know the reason for your stance uh, that I too share, Jazakallah Khair, uh, Sheikh. Well, uh, my brother Hamza, Hamza uh, the, you know, it's a very complex issue and uh, I myself have been driven in my own way to investigate the matter anew. I, I know that uh, the Mu'tazilis had some um, hesitance with regards to Hadith. I know that the Hanafi school has a particular way of um, not giving full credence to Hadith, especially Hadith which are only related by a few people uh, relating something that was done publicly, because if it was done publicly, a lot of people should have known it and, and related it. So how come only a few people and so on. Uh, and uh, of course, I'm already uh, also aware of uh, modern studies that have been done, like for example Khalid Abu Fadl and um, and others who have looked at this. Most recently, Asra Ahmed uh, Khan. Uh, but uh, my own uh, take on on this uh, is largely due to my own uh, probing of the Hadith uh, books. Um, like knowing, I'm I'm giving credit to all of these scholars who have had something in shaping my my thinking. Um, but uh, it, a lot has to do, like the, the the to firm up my conclusion and to pick a position, had a lot to do with my own reading of the books of Hadith and and coming to see that uh, there are uh, errors and and contradictions uh, uh, among the narratives. And uh, you, you cannot say that all of this is credited back to the Prophet, peace be upon him, because then you would be crediting him with the errors and the contradictions and, uh, and, and reports, which are just uh, simply um, uh, unbelievable, let's put it that way. So, um, uh, yeah, so it's a complex thing. It's not just one. Uh, like it's not just okay because the Mu'tazili said that I believe that or, or something like this, but it's a whole complex of putting together everything uh, we know, uh, and and it hinges on my own study of of the sources. Okay, Nahian, uh, does Philippians uh, chapter two teach that God emptied Himself in human flesh? Most Trinitarians quote this letter uh, to support the idea that Jesus emptied Himself in a human form. Well, you know, Philippians chapter 2 is uh, is an ambiguous passage because it says that Jesus was in the form of God. Uh, but what does that mean in the form of God? Does it mean that because uh, humans were created in the image of God and Jesus is, in, is a kind of a perfect image of God, so he was in a kind of a form of God? What is meant by form of God anyway? Does God have a form? Uh, so all of these are puzzling uh, issues. What seems most likely is that uh, Paul, in, in harmony with everything he said in all of his uh, undisputed writings uh, it holds to the position that Jesus is somewhere between God and man uh, so he is an intermediary type of being he is the Lord through which God created everything else so there's one God and there is one Lord so Jesus is that Lord perhaps he was in a kind of a he was a divine being uh, of sorts before he became a man and then he is lifted back up into a position of, of glory. Uh, but he was never God and never has become God. So, uh, you know, how could he be given a, a position of glory? Like, let's say the whole um, uh, lesson behind this is that if you lower yourself, God will raise you. Uh, well, God will raise you to a position higher than you had because you, you, you know, he's now rewarding you for your humility. So if you were this high, you go down a little bit, God sees your humility, and then he rewards you for that humility by raising you higher than you were, were before. Uh, so that makes sense. But if he's going to just raise you back to the position where you are, then where's the reward for your humility? Uh, so Jesus must have been somewhere between God and man, uh, having a high position nonetheless he lowers himself to the position of a man and then God lifts him higher than what he was before so then it makes sense but higher than he was before doesn't mean that he's God it just means that he's um, you know a, a special uh, person the way to say that in the Quran is to say he's one of those who are close to God but it doesn't mean that he is uh, God Okay, Salu saying, uh, from the four Gospels, which one according to you feels authentic, or at least uh, you feel, 
uh, that this makes sense? Can you name that one particular gospel out of the four? Well, I would say uh, that you know all four have uh, some interesting features, and uh, it, we we can't say take uh, everything in one and 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 leave all of the rest. But we can say that it, it, there, there are individual episodes in the life of Jesus that are narrated in the four Gospels. Some appear only in one Gospel, some appear in two, some appear in three, some appear in all four. Uh, all, uh, and this is what Christian scholars do, the uh, academics at least. They, they weigh each narrative on its own merits and they try to decide narrative by narrative, story by story, uh, which one of these stories are authentic, which are not authentic. So they don't take uh, one gospel and leave the rest, uh, but but they weigh the narratives to see what makes coherence, uh, what what makes uh, ultimate sense, uh, or or uh, what is a best better explanation for how things unfolded between what Jesus actually did and what comes to be recorded now in the Gospels. So uh, another way of putting it is if the Gospel says this, what must have been uh, the truth, what must have actually happened for the Gospel to report it like this? And so there is a lot of uh, uh, thinking that goes uh, to unravel uh, the mystery of how it came to be recorded in the Gospels like this. So we take it story by story. So when we do it like that, we see that there is much in the Gospel according to Mark that uh, Muslims can appreciate. And we see that the later Gospels are trying to update that story and make it more Christian. So remember the story in Mark chapter 4 where Jesus uh, um, calmed the storm and the disciples were, you know, at the end, they were asking, who is this? Well, in, in Matthew's Gospel, same story, basically, and almost word for word in many places. But then in Matthew's Gospel, they, uh, they, they worship him. Uh, it's like, you know, now they know uh, it, that they ought to worship him. But in Mark's story, they didn't. So you see that this is an improvement along Christian lines. The story is becoming more Christian as we go from the earliest gospel to the later gospels. And uh, in a similar way, we see in Mark chapter 5, which we've already studied today, that, uh, you know, Jesus um, uh, didn't seem to know where the power had gone out to and uh, and who was healed and he's looking around to see who has touched him and as we go to the later gospels we'll see that the story is improved uh, so that uh, uh, Jesus becomes more knowledgeable. I don't remember the details now, uh, but uh, that's basically what is happening as we go from an earlier gospel to uh, a later gospel. Okay, Hamza, Hamza uh, saying, Sheikh, it seems that when reading John chapter 3, verse 16, which Christians love quoting to summarize their belief, it doesn't say anything about Jesus being God. What are your, your thoughts? Well, that's an interesting observation, Brother Hamza, Hamza, because there it's, it only speaks about God giving his only begotten son. And uh, if, if you want to say that Jesus is God, why would you call him the son of God? Why don't you just say he's God? I mean, it, that's very clear. And if they say, no, that's going to be confusion because there are three persons. Well, why, why don't you call them person one person two person three person a person b person c if you want to use greek uh, person alpha uh, 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 person beta person uh, gamma uh, and and so on uh, and if you want to have a fourth then person delta um, as we are naming the coronavirus variants now, like why don't uh, name them? This is Alpha, this is Delta, this is Omicron. Um, uh, so, so I mean, it, it, it's easy to do that rather than to call this one son. Like, how do you call one son? Uh, let's say we we uh, we uh, we know God to be one. Let's say uh, Jews believing God to be one. They don't have this idea of Trinity, but they see how a father takes care of his children, and they say, you know what, God is like a father. So now they start calling God Father. Now it makes sense that uh, in a way, and although Muslims don't do that, but it makes sense in a way to understand that people are seeing the relationships here on earth and they're, they're saying, okay, well, God must be like something like that. It's almost like Jesus in the New Testament saying, you know, how I want to gather uh, you as, uh, you know, a hen gathers chicks. Well, uh, some such um, uh, feminist uh, type of... Um, 
of uh, like a feminizing uh, type of imagery is given for God in some passages in the Old Testament rare, but it is there, like God giving birth, for example. Uh, so uh, again, one can see what is happening on earth and how mothers care for their children and the birth pains that the mother feels. And one can say, okay, maybe God is something like this. So we go maybe retrodirect back to God, what we observe here on earth. Now, if you think about the situation with God, uh, according to Christians uh, generally, uh, the creation is ex nihilo, created from nothing, uh, and before that God was all alone. Well, they say the three persons of the Trinity, so God was not alone. But now, when you have the three persons of the Trinity before the creation of the earth, and there's no father, son, mother, son, mother, child relationship on earth, uh, why would God, you know, uh, call, why would one of them call themselves call himself the father, the other one the son? Uh, and, and the Holy, other one, the Holy Spirit, whereas they're, they're all spirits and they're all holy. So they're three Holy Spirits. Like, why would you call one of them the Holy Spirit? Why would you call one of them Father and the other one Son? Uh, as, you know, indicating a kind of a hierarchy and differentiation uh, with one being the source of the other and so on. Um, but but that's, that's how these are the terms that are on earth. Why not, you know, original God? uh derivative god and so on like because that that would be a a, a, a universalizing language uh, when when carl sagan as part of the uh, seti program search for extraterrestrial intelligence uh put out a probe uh to see if anybody would respond they put that in mathematical language because this would be the a universal language um, because if you put it in English or, you know, it's, there's, there's little chance that somebody in another um, uh, planet on, on another star, like uh, 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 surrounding another star, uh, is going to speak our, our language. But uh, mathematics is thought to be a universal language. So they put things using mathematical symbols and so on to see if anybody would detect this and um, and decipher this and, and respond. Um, and of course, the search still goes on. Uh, but uh, my, my point here is that uh, it, if, you know, if, if God uh, existed as three persons prior to the creation of the world, then uh, there's no reason why one would be called Father, the other one would be called uh, Son, the other, other one would be called the Holy Spirit. They would have some kind of universalizing uh, way of uh, differentiating between the three. And, and the father-son differentiation comes from our experience here on earth. So this is uh, almost an indication that it is human beings who uh, called one father and called the other one son. It's not God revealing uh, himself in that, in that way. And uh, Allah knows best. Okay, so uh, Hamza, Hamza, Sheikh, uh, are there any prophecies in the Bible about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, which are strong? I hear one about the location of Bakka, which is a, uh, it, uh, it being a strong one. Well, the, the prophecies in the Old Testament generally require some interpretation. And, um, and uh, be, because uh, there's been a lot of interpretation on that already, I, uh, I feel that um, it is important for me to learn Hebrew some more before I go deeper into that. So basically, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm leaving that aside for the moment. Uh, Isaiah 43 two has received some commentary from uh, some important uh, Muslim uh, uh, scholars like for example Ali Atai and I would recommend that you study his uh, commentary on that though I myself I must confess did not get a chance to study that in detail uh, because that at the moment is not my focus I'm doing a lot of studies on the Trinity and, and so on uh, and as a whole, I have felt that the Old Testament requires some interpretation, which uh, I, you know, need to study some more Hebrew to be able to get a better grasp of, in order to say that this passage refers to our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, in, in debate and dialogue and, and so on. Um, uh, there, there is a, a student of um, uh, the uh, Sheikh of pa in Pakistan, Javed Ghadimi, uh, Javed Ghamidi, and that student's name escapes me at the moment, but he's actually written something on Isaiah 42. And uh, I have seen some uh, commentary of his uh, on a particular passage, uh, either in Isaiah 42 or in another passage, uh, that showed his knowledge of the Hebrew. And he was able to bring out things from uh, Christian commentaries on, on the Bible, uh, which most people did not uh, 
no, and I, I benefited from that, and I would recommend his work. But as I said, I can't remember his name at the moment. But he wrote uh, a, a booklet on, or a book on Isaiah 42, and, and I saw it selling on, on uh, Amazon, I believe. And um, I had intended to buy a uh, Kindle copy of that, and maybe I did. I don't re recall exactly, but uh, I'll have to look back into that. Okay. Uh, Salma. Oh, but uh, to answer your question, Hamzain, uh, the other aspect of that is that the New Testament has uh, been very interesting to me fr from this perspective. And I've given a whole lecture in the past, and uh, in, on one of my live posts here, I went into detail about that as well, showing passages in the New Testament that would indicate another prophet to come after Jesus on, on whom be peace. Uh, so look, look for that among my videos on this uh, Facebook page, and then on another occasion, inshallah, I'll come back to it because uh, a lot of people have since asked about it and either they're not available aware of that video or maybe the video is no longer there to be found I don't know but it's worth repeating and perhaps with some more research uh, the repetition will be uh, presenting the matter in a better way than than before okay Salu Salman Dr. Shabir don't you think that Paul corrupted the original message of Jesus and he is the one responsible for the entire manipulation of the one true message well, um, th there is a lot to be said about Paul. Um, at one time, I would have simplistically uh, said yes to your uh, question, uh, but now I understand the uh, matter to be very complex. It, it is certain that Paul had a very great influence in the shaping of uh, Christianity, and some uh, uh, regard him as the second founder of Christianity. Some regard him as the founder of Christianity. Um, but uh, the uh, some new studies have been done, um, resulting in what is called the new perspective on Paul. Uh, this uh, is a, a term that uh, is uh, associated with James uh, D.G. Dunn um, and uh, uh, N.T. Wright. Uh, they think that uh, Paul uh, did not want to cancel the law for uh, Jewish followers of Jesus, but was only saying that uh, some aspects of the law are not required of Gentile followers of Jesus, and so on. So this is a whole complex study, and uh, I need to do more study regarding that. But we can see that some aspects of Christian teaching, uh, like the idea of the um, blood atonement of Jesus, um, this the sacri blood sacrifice of Jesus resulting in the atonement of Christians, the atonement with God. Um, this has a lot to do with the writings of Paul and his exposition of this uh, doctrine more than anyone else in the New Testament. So some out of the 27 books of the New Testament, some 13 uh, bear the name of Paul as the writer. Of these 13, seven are thought to be undisputedly his writings and uh, the other six are disputed, whether he wrote them or somebody wrote them using his uh, name. A 14th document, the he uh, letter to the Hebrews, uh, or just simply Hebrews, was thought to be written by Paul, uh, but nowadays it is widely accepted that this one is an anonymous document. Nobody knows who actually uh, wrote it. So you can see the great influence of Paul uh, on the later shaping of Christianity in that some 13 of the 27 documents bear his name and uh, one additional one was thought to nonetheless be written by him as well. Okay, Hamza, Hamza, uh, Sheikh, uh, what do you think of the Quran mentioning stories from the apocryphal gospel, such as blowing into clear birds? Do you th take the story as having happened? If not, then how do we take any historical approach to the Quran? And what's stopping us from saying that all the stories of the Quran is just the Quran narrating what people already knew, Jazakallah khairan. So here we have some ambiguity, Brother Hamza, Hamza, like, uh, your your question follows like how do we know where do we draw the line um, and uh, we, we have to say that the the Quran does what it does in an excellent way without requiring us to affirm the historicity of the stories of of the past because the Quran's point is not the historicity of those stories uh, the Quran's point is the moral and the teaching that comes out of those uh, of those stories okay Hamza Hamza saying Sheikh what do you think of the argument of fitra against the atheist uh, what are your thoughts uh, on the argument? Well, uh, there, there are some things that we accept once we accept some other preliminaries. Once we accept that there is a God, we accept that God creates us, uh, we accept that God created us in a way that is beneficial for us, and that would be the way of the fitra. Uh, so for an atheist who does not believe in God, 
they would not accept that they are created on the fitra. And if you say, but wait a minute, sometimes when you are in trouble, you say, uh, oh God, you're reaching out to God. Isn't that like a natural um, a response from the person? And they might say, well, but, I mean, that's because we have been conditioned. So in the cultures in which we uh, grew up. And uh, so the, the matter remains a little bit unsettled in, in that way. But uh, our assurance to, be, to them should be that according to our belief, we are created under fitra, they are created under fitra as well, and we are calling back them back to that uh, fitra. Uh, Muhammad, uh, M. Muhammad, Jazakum uh, al Sheikh, I benefit a lot from your vast knowledge. Thank you, my brother. And uh, please make dua for me as well. Your name is Muhammad uh, Doshirovic. Uh, bless you and all the people around you. Dennis, my friend. In the Bible, death is a deep sleep. You said it is not so clear if the girl died or just was asleep. Actually, it is clear that she died. Here is the passage in John 11, 11 14. After he said these things, he added, Lazarus, your friend, has fallen asleep, but I am traveling there to awaken him. Uh, the disciples then said to him, Lord, if he is sleeping, he will get well. Jesus, however, had spoken about his death, but the imagine he was talking about taking rest and sleep then Jesus uh, said to them plainly Lazarus had died uh, but for God they are not uh, dead just for us they are dead now uh, Dennis so uh, it, it is clear that in John's gospel uh, this is being clarified we are saying sleep but we mean death and so on but uh, notice that in Mark's gospel this clarity is not there and if you think of back to a time when people were reading Mark's gospel and they didn't have John yet uh, then uh, reading Mark's gospel one can make the point that uh, it's not so clear if the girl was dead or not and that's just the point that I was trying to make from Mark's gospel alone, even though a lot of things that we're um, showing to be uh, points coming out of Mark's gospel are, are later on um, given a different slant in, in the gospels of Mark, of, of Matthew, Luke, and eventually uh, John. So you can say that these are variants of the story uh, that, that take on new meaning in the later Gospels. Okay, Adi Kunli uh, saying, Thank you, Dr. Shabir. May Allah increase your knowledge and wisdom and bless you with long, healthy life. Thank you, my brother, and the same for you and everyone around you. May Allah SWT bless you all with knowledge, with wisdom, and uh, with health and uh, long life and guidance. Uh, all of you, may, may Allah SWT bless you all. Okay, Kony, uh, or uh, sorry if I mispronounce your name, uh, Mamadou, uh, same Shalam, and Salam to you, my brother, Farhan Najib, Salam Dr. Shabir, Wa Alaikum Salam. Are there Christians like Gary Wills uh, who believe that uh, Jesus, peace be upon him, is a prophet? Now, you know, I don't know much about Gary Wills, though I bought one of his books and I intended to read it, and I have actually read portions of it but I don't remember precisely what he said because you know I read so much sometimes it's hard to remember but what I read form uh, impressions on my mind uh, almost like layers of of you know cement going on there and solidifying sometimes what I already know modifying what I already know and so on but then sometimes I don't remember what precisely I read from which uh, writer uh, but yes, there are uh, Christians who believe that Jesus is a prophet. You know, among uh, ordinary average Christians, even though they might go to a church that is Trinitarian in their uh, official uh, confession, uh, the average Christian may just believe, like us, that Jesus is a prophet. Maybe they'll say son of God, but they mean by that a man who is uh, approved by God and, and so on, one who is beloved to God, not necessarily uh, a literal son of God. And so on, and there could be, uh, there are um, Christian teachers as well. Uh, there are uh, Unitarian Christians uh, who believe that uh, there is only one God, and Jesus is somehow the servant of that God. Anthony Buzzard has written much about this, and his writings are available. Uh, for example, the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, Christianity's self-inflicted wound. So they believe that Jesus is uh, a servant of God and uh, and not God. Um, uh, they would believe more than that, you know, that they, because they, they have passages, especially in John's Gospel and others that say that through Jesus, God created everything else and so on. So their belief goes uh, beyond ours with regards to Jesus, but nonetheless, they are far below the doctrine of the Trinity. And uh, Ibrahim Namaru saying, MashaAllah, Sheikh, and thank you, my brother, keep making dua for me. Hamza, Hamza, Sheikh, you spoke about Khalid Abdul Fadl's work on Hadith. Is there somewhere we can find this? Is 
uh, it in one of his books. Uh, so the um, the book that I recall in which he has expounded on this uh, quite a bit is the book entitled Speaking in the Name of God. Speaking in the Name of God. I believe that's the title of the book. Uh, okay, and uh, Adi Kunli Adi Banjo uh, asking, can God be considered almighty if he needs uh, the Son and Holy Spirit to operate, especially needing to make sacrifice, and to who will the sacrifice be made? And you're right, Brother Adi Kunli, these are, are important questions and, uh, and, and uh, problems uh, that arise uh, for those who say that, uh, that Jesus was God, or there was a trinity, or God had to sacrifice his Son for the sins of humankind, or something of this nature. Uh, Mudarisul Rashid, uh, and Dr. Shabir Ali for sharing all this knowledge with us. Thank you, my brother Madarisu, and uh, keep making dua for me. May Allah SWT bless you and all the people around you. Uh, Adi Kunli, uh, whose record can be considered more authentic to the teachings of Christ, Paul's or Barnabas? Now, um, and let's say something about Barnabas because we already said something about Paul. So, my brother, the uh, uh, the Gospel of Barnabas uh, has been um, a, a recent discovery uh, relative to the two thousand years uh, long history uh, of of you know, people who um, said they are Christians, and uh, because of that, uh, we we don't have a continuous chain linking the Gospel of Barnabas all the way back to the earliest uh, time, and so we cannot treat this as necessarily a uh, an authentic writing. Uh, about Jesus and his uh, earlier um, followers. Um, so, so that's a problem for the Gospel of Barnabas. But that doesn't mean that our only resort is the, is the writings of Paul. Uh, we can, scholars are trying to retrace uh, what did Jesus actually say, what did he actually teach, even before Paul came on the scene. Paul's writings are from about two decades after uh, Jesus, on whom BPs peace, had already left the scene. So what was the scene in the time of Jesus? This is what scholars are trying to reconstruct. And in reconstructing that image of Jesus, they're not finding a person who taught that he is God uh, or that he will die for the sins of the world. Uh, and, and that is the image that is, I mean, this reconstruction gives credence to the Muslim message, which, though coming much later, 600 years after Jesus and whom be peace, nonetheless, uh, coincides with the reconstructed image of Jesus as a human being, as a prophet of God, like the prophets of the Old Testament. Hamza Hamza, thank you for your time and blessings, Sheikh. Uh, my thanks to you, Brother Hamza Hamza, as well. Your questions, your comments, uh, your being here uh, keeps me uh, going and is an inspiration for me as well. So thank you all. And uh, from IJ Abdul Hakim, question What is your view on the synoptic, uh, on the synoptic uh, problem? I think the arguments are pretty solid, but depending on the manuscript tradition, given that some of them deal with grammatical errors in Mark and that were later corrected in Luke and Matthew, isn't it possible that Mark uh, manuscript scribes introduced this as a scribal error? On that note, I can't help but feel that many of those against the existence of Q are often uh, based on a conservative or evangelical uh, bias. Uh, though there are scholar, secular scholars like Mark Goodacre who have similar views. Okay, so as for the um, you know the correction of the grammatical errors in Mark, uh, as we we see in Matthew and and Luke, uh, could the grammatical errors have uh, uh, in Mark have resulted from scribal um, mistakes in copying? So um, uh, my, my brother Abdul Hakim, when the scholars are, are doing this comparison, they're doing the comparison based on what is reconstructed as the, uh, the closest we can get back to the gospel according to Mark. And uh, when they do, so they, they're trying to weed out and ignore the grammatical errors. They're trying to retrace the steps of the uh, copyists and see what was the um, uh, closest we can reconstruct of Mark's uh, uh, original manuscript. And, and based on that kind of analysis, they are seeing that Matthew and Luke was an improvement over Mark, even in terms of, uh, of grammar. So they're not going with the grammatical mistakes that may have been introduced uh, later on. But having said that, there are some instances where um, um, uh, Matthew and, uh, and Luke are in agreement um, uh, as against Mark. So if they were copying from Mark, how is it that the two of them 
have such close uh, verbal agreement as distinct from Mark. Um, so it would look like Mark was copying from one of them and changing the story rather than they copying from Mark and making the same change in the same place in the same remarkable way. Uh, but uh, here uh, scholars introduce uh, a solution which they uh, refer to as the or Marcus solution where they say that when we talk about Matthew and Luke using Mark we should posit that they were using an earlier version of Mark. Um, and what they call the or markers, the source of Mark's gospel. And, and Mark's present day gospel is a, is a copy of that original uh, source Mark. Um, but for simplicity, because those are only few and far between uh, instances uh, where Matthew and Luke have uh, such close agreement uh, against Mark, that uh, we don't need to always speak about or markers that's only there in the background to be invoked if and when necessary uh, but uh, the better explanation and simple explanation is to say that matthew and luke copied from our present day mark um, now as for uh, denying the gospel q's existence um, uh, well, even some, some scholars who are not evangelical and so on might say, okay, why posit the existence of a, of, of a hypothetical document? Now, uh, let's work with what we actually see in our hands. And can we explain the relationship among the Gospels without invoking a, a second, a, another document? So some, like uh, I believe Michael Goulder was on this uh, position, um, and you mentioned Mark Goodacre. I believe Mark Goodacre is a student of, of uh, Michael Goulder. Let me see what your question said. Uh, though there are secular scholars who have similar views. Yeah, so, I, uh, so, so Mark Goodacre, I believe, is one of those who, um, following his teacher, um, Michael Goulder, would hold that you don't need to posit the existence of a document like Q, which is only you know which we don't have in our hands. Uh, what they would say is that the agreements uh, are uh, explained in this way. So let's say you have Mark first, and then Matthew copying Mark, uh, following closely, and then Mark Matthew using uh, another other sorts of information as well, uh, and then Luke copying from both uh, Matthew and and Mark. Uh, so that would explain a lot, and that would explain where Luke is getting a lot of the uh, sayings uh, material from, from Matthew's Gospel uh, particularly, and in that case Luke does not need to go to another document called Q, which, which we do not have. Uh, but uh, other scholars respond to this sort of scenario by saying that if Mark was, if Matthew was copying from another gospel, uh, from 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 an other sources, those were either written or unwritten sources. But in any case, uh, that's the source that we're calling Q, the, from which Matthew is deriving all of those sayings. And uh, it is easier to see that that Luke was. Um, but that both Matthew and Luke are deriving the sayings from the same document rather than to think that Luke is deriving it from Matthew and uh, changing it the way he, he does at certain uh, junctures. So uh, in the end, we can say that, you know, this is uh, still uh, an, an open question, but most scholars who work on this in great detail uh, prefer the simple view uh, that uh, both uh, Matthew and Luke uh, copied from two sources that is Mark on the one hand and Q, the hypothetical source on the other hand. Okay, uh, I.J. Abdullah came asking again, question, I was reading James' own book on uh, did the first Christians worship Jesus and some of uh, Dr. Crispin Fletcher Lewis's works. Uh, one issue that seems to arise are the diverse theological views of Second Temple Judaism. Some may have a monolatrous uh, view rather than monotheistic. Others may have been monotheistic. Uh, monotheist, but use pagan language. Given this confusion, it seems that uh, even reading the New Testament for Christology is very complicated as it requires uh, knowing many detailed and nuanced statements on what an author exactly believed. Uh, your thoughts would be appreciated. Yeah. So uh, you've touched upon, upon a very important subject here, my brother, and um, you mentioned Dr. Uh, Crispin Fletcher Lewis's works. I'm not familiar with this scholar. Um, it, uh, James Dunn's uh, book, uh, Did the First Christians Worship Jesus, I have read. 
and uh, and I appreciate. Uh, so then, uh, how, what, what do I make of all of this? Uh, you will notice in some of my recent debates, especially my debates with Anthony uh, Rogers, uh, that I I uh, drew attention to this uh, problem. Uh, like you you have in in Second Temple Judaism this, uh, and by that we mean the the period from about uh, you know, like 500 uh, BC to. Um, uh, the time of, of Jesus on Home peace up until it was destroyed, the temple was destroyed in about 66 uh, AD. So for in this period of time, which is called Second Temple Judaism, uh, it, it, it is known to scholars now that what we're calling monotheism is not the same as what they call monotheism. Today, when Muslims speak of monotheism, they mean that there is only one God, and that is the only God that there is. Everything else should not be called God. They're all creatures of God and so on. Um, and only the one God desires to be worshipped. But in Second Temple Judaism, uh, Jews, though considering themselves to be monotheists, nevertheless uh, have an idea of intermediary figures between God and human beings. And some of these intermediary figures may receive some worship, adoration, they receive the name of God, an angel may be given the name of God, and so on. Uh, so. Uh, when in the New Testament uh, someone cites a passage and says, oh, this sh sh seems to mean that Jesus is greater than a human being. Uh, well, greater than a human being, but does that mean he's God? He could be an intermediary being. This is my point to them now. And uh, moreover, like if, if you take one of the passages in the New Testament as uh, a meaning that the particular author uh, thought that uh, Jesus was God, uh, then uh, how do you explain that? Did, does he mean that uh, Jesus is an intermediary figure who might be called God, or does he mean that Jesus is the ultimate God? There are all of these uh, questions. Uh, so uh, please look at some of my past uh, debates regarding that, um, and maybe in another um, post I will explain this particular point in some more uh, detail. And then finally, we have uh, uh, Abu Bakr Mustafa saying, Salam, wa alaikum as -salam, my brother. Thank you. Thank you all for joining me. And thank you all for uh, those who have sh shared my post. I see Abu Bakr has done that as well. Uh, brother Muhammad Mustafa, Sister Fatima, uh, and uh, Brother Ehtisham Syed. Um, please, uh, you know, continue to do that. And I thank you for doing that. Uh, Sister Lalisa Muhammad, uh, or brother, sorry if I... Uh, misjudged uh, the gender and uh, I do appreciate all of your help and Adi, uh, Adil Kunli uh, and Ubaidullah and uh, Lim uh, Muwa. I thank you all for doing that and if I missed any names uh, please forgive me it was not intentional I just scroll through quickly and I call out uh, what I see but uh, I may have passed over something uh, not intentionally so please forgive me for any errors or omissions my brothers and sisters please help me in continuing this good work of sharing the message of uh, Islam with the wider world you can do this by donating uh, go to our organization's website islaminfo.com islaminfo.com and uh, click on the donate button that's where you can send a donation to help our mission uh, continue for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you from around the world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you all. I know there are people here from many different countries. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and all of the people of your countries. Keep you all safe from COVID-19 and from every other sickness and disease and stress and distress. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you health and happiness and a high state of Iman and guidance and uh, bless you and all of your progeny. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite us under the shade of his throne on the day of judgment. And even before that, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wipe away this pandemic and give us a chance to travel and meet each other as brothers and sisters in faith and, and as friends, even if we do not share the same faith. So thank you all again. Peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.